Welcome to the Hardcore MBA Podcast with your host, Erland Bakke. Would you like to have a free copy of the number one international best-selling book, Never Work Again? All you have to do is rate, review, and subscribe to Hardcore MBA Podcast on iTunes and email us a screenshot of your review to erland at mroutsource.com. Would you like to have a free copy of the number one international best-selling book, Never Work Again? All you have to do is rate, review, and subscribe to Hardcore MBA Podcast on iTunes and email us a screenshot of your review to erland at mroutsource.com. Hello and welcome to Hardcore MBA. If you're an entrepreneur and you want to succeed, you do need a team to collaborate with. Now in 2015, you're likely to be working with people all over the globe. Now, how do you actually manage their time? How do you know that they're doing the tasks that you want them to do? Now, that's why I invited Liam Martin here today. He is the co-founder of TimeDoctor.com, an employee metrics company that works with making remote teams work better. Think uh, Google Analytics for your team. Well, that's a great show. ad. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, Erland. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of fun because we haven't really gotten into the details of outsourcing, but I know that you're an expert in it and uh, I'm not too bad either. So I think it'll be a great chat. So now you have more than 15,000 users. You've got more than a million hours a month being logged with Time Doctor. Mm -hmm. How did you get to that point? Oh boy, that is a... That's a very long story. That's probably a much more than a 30 minute uh, chat, but I'll try to break, break it down um, into two or three minutes. So we had started Time Doctor off of actually me and my co-founder, uh, we were at, I had just sold one of my companies and um, we were at uh, South by Southwest, which is this tech conference in Austin, Texas. And, um, it's, I was speaking on this panel. So I meet Rob, who is actually a mutual friend's mentor, and he has this really crappy, you know, app that just sort of tracks the metrics of an employee's time. And the previous company that I had been in was a um, online tutoring company. So basically what we did is we tutored students through Skype. And we had a niche, which was uh, the medical field. So we would teach the courses that you needed to go into medical school. And we made sure that you would get an A in them. And it was, it, it was huge. We went from, um, you know, you know, one to two employees. I, I basically dropped out of grad school to be able to do this. I went from one to two employees to more than 100 remote uh, tutors within two years. And things were going great. But the problem that I had was... Jimmy would come in, Jimmy the student would come in and say, hey, um, Susie, my tutor, uh, you billed me for 10 hours with Susie and we only worked for five. So then I'd have to go to the tutor and I'd say, hey, did you work with 10 hours with this student this month? And she'd say, absolutely. But what I would have to end up doing is pay Susie her entire 10 hours and then refund the student for the other five hours. And I would not make any money whatsoever and that was very slowly killing the business time doctor would have allowed me to scale that business to the next level which was what I was missing so I immediately looked at that app I thought man this is something that would work perfectly for me I already have experience with remote teams and this is the solution that I was looking for started working with Rob and uh, three years later we're at as I said before a million hours a month and a hundred million in uh, in yearly payments through the system. So we're really, as I said, a little bit different from everyone else. We do remote team analytics as opposed to simply time tracking. So we won't track just how long you've worked. We'll track how productively you've worked. So what websites did you go to? What applications were you using? How efficiently are you using your time? Because I think that, as you said before, time is, in my opinion, the most precious resource that you can have. Uh, it's not fungible. You can't, you can't stock it away. It's spent and then it's 
you can never you can never use it again uh, once you've used it and you can't slow it down you can't speed it up so for me you want to make yourself as efficient as humanly possible and uh, time doctor is a small part of making that process a little bit better don't feel people feel like they're being monitored absolutely um, and sometimes I would say that that is a that is a good thing in some cases. Um, I know for us, we've had quite a few customers that have come to us, um, and most of them are large organizations of, let's say, you know, 500 employees, and they'll come in and say, well, you know, we're, we've hired a whole bunch of people off of Odesk as an example, and they seem to be doing a whole bunch of work, but I don't really know whether or not they're doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. Um, because we're not really getting the results for the amount of hours that are being put in. Are my employees less, are these remote employees less efficient than the local ones? So we would install Time Doctor and we'd find out, we just had a horrible case a little while ago where a senior level developer was using auto clicker software, um, which is one of the dirty secrets that a lot of these platforms don't really want to tell you about, mm -hmm. which uh, basically replicates mouse movements and clicks and changes screens on a computer monitor to be able to basically trick people into thinking that they're working uh, longer than they're supposed to be working. So as an example, this one guy was working, he said that he was working 53 hours, but 26 of those were from the auto clicker software within that week. So we detect that automatically. Um, and that's one of the things as a first level, we say everyone has to be on board and ready to um, accept this type of tracking. Secondly, from that, everyone within our organization can see each other's data. So everyone within my company can see uh, exactly what I'm doing with my workday. I'm currently working on podcast with Erland mm -hmm. and uh, I've been doing it for 26 minutes and they know that right now I'm on a Google Doc, right, as I'm speaking to you right now. So they'll be able to get those metrics at any point. And what that creates is a completely open work environment where anyone can see what anyone else is doing. And we feel like for us, it's just, it, it's a much more open work environment um, than, than a closed one. We have a bunch of guys that will use the software for their founding teams. So if you have two or three co-founders, as an example, and you're just starting out, they'll use Time Doctor and they'll write it into their founding agreements to say everyone must work at minimum 30 hours per week or your shares get damaged from that because it's so important at the beginning of a startup, as you probably know, to make sure that everyone is putting their full effort into the project. So for us, it's just legitimacy and then on the back end, uh, like openness and legitimacy and then the back end, there are some people who are unfortunately taking advantage of uh, remote worker agreements and uh, we don't think that that's, that's right either. So it's actually like a co-working space, but you are uh, other places. So you can actually, sure. so you're actually being held accountable. Um, because other people can go in and see what you're doing, what you're not doing, and how many hours. So how many people actually slack off um, uh, statistically? In our company, zero. <laughs> uh, everyone works incredibly hard, actually, in our company. So we'll be able to see, as an example, let's say that someone spends, uh, in a 40-hour work week, let's say they spend half an hour to an hour on Facebook. I have no problem with that. If someone is spending five to 10 hours on Facebook per 40 hour work week, and they are someone who shouldn't be on Facebook as part of their job, that's when we would come in and sort of chat with them and see, okay, what are you actually doing here? What's, uh, what's going on with, with this particular uh, employee? Um, I would say for me, it just sort of creates, as I said before, a really open, as, as probably you put it quite well, this sort of open workspace environment. Within that, you'll definitely see some people that are a little bit less productive than others. Uh, I actually have, we don't, we're not able to granularize data in, in our terms of service. Basically, we can't see your individual data, but we do see it as an overall metric. So I can see how many hours were tracked on Google Docs across our entire network 
um, every single day if I want to. Or I can see how much time was tracked against Slack. One of the uh, most amazing things that I've seen, which is a blog post we're putting out quite soon, is the rise of Slack. We literally have the largest second-by-second -second web and uh, application tracking database on the planet. So we've seen Slack move from nothing two years ago to the 12th most used application within our network, which is just insane. I've never seen anything like it. Um, it's, it's just exploding <laughs> as a business right now. And you can see that they're worth billions and billions of dollars and they're doing fantastically well. Um, but you'll see, like, I can see also the average hours tracked in the United States versus the average hours tracked in the Philippines versus the average hours tracked in Brazil. And there's a lot of differentiation. Um, the concept of the 50 hour work week that the United States says that they're working, uh, that's untrue. And we have much more granular data than any, you know, any academic organization does. The average work week in the United States, and this is based off of thousands of data points, is 27 hours and 32 minutes. That's how much someone spends on their computer working per week. And that's reasonable. You know, when you think about that, it's, it's absolutely reasonable because you have somebody who is, uh, let's say you're probably taking five to 10 hours off per week for breaks and for chats and for bathroom breaks and, you know, lunches and all that kind of stuff. That makes absolute sense. Um, but to be able to suggest that they are working a 50 and 60 hour work week is untrue. It's all self-reported data and the, the data is bad. Um, we're the only ones that actually have a huge data set of, as I said before, second by second metrics. And uh, in comparison, the Philippines is a 36 hour work week, 36 hours and I think like 20 something minutes uh, per week. And that's been continuous. And that's based off of thousands of data points. This podcast is brought to you by MrOutsource.com. Outsourcing to the Philippines done for you. It is very easy to be able to see who is working harder. It's actually one of those things I'd like to be able to write a blog post about this in the future, which is um, connecting GDP per capita to hours worked. And we find that the lower your GDP per capita is, the harder you work, ironically, which is really not fair. Uh, but that's the reality of the way that global, you know, socioeconomics work. For now. For now, there's, that is changing. I mean, you, you've seen the rise of China. You've seen the rise of Southeast Asia. Um, they're gaining more earning power. Uh, over the last 10 years that I've been doing remote work, I've gone from hiring people in the Philippines for $100 an hour, or sorry, um, a month, to hiring them on average for like $1,500 per month. It's a huge difference for, for achieving that top quality labor. And you look at their GDP per capita, and that's absolutely reflected in their GP, GDP per capita. Um, so it is a interesting time, I would say, for the global community. I believe that there are some countries that are doing it right. The Philippines is one of them. Um, there's a few Eastern European countries that are doing excellent work in terms of encouraging remote work. Uh, there are other companies that are there are other countries that are not, and I think they're falling behind. Uh, right now, I would say probably if you want to keep your labor in your country of choice and you don't want them uh, going to another country, i.e. the US, uh, the UK, Canada, Australia, having remote work agreements is critical for that process. Why would you say that? So we just, as I had spoken uh, to you about earlier, we had recently hired somebody who was, I'm not going to tell you which place they got, but they ranked very highly in a Facebook hackathon, the global Facebook hackathon. Uh, they were offered a job from Facebook. They were offered a job from Google. And these were both very healthy six-figure positions. He decided to work with us for significantly less because he did not want to leave his country, of uh, his, his country where he lived. He had his family here. He had his he had sis, he, you know he had a he had a life uh, in that country. And if he hadn't have had remote uh, 
the, the environment to be able to do remote work, he probably would have moved to San Francisco. And he probably would have had a great life in San Francisco, but he didn't want to leave to go down to that city. He wanted to stay where he was. And remote work empowered that employee to stay. And that's the cream of, I mean, when Facebook does these hackathons, they have tens of thousands of people that attempt these hackathons. And they only grab the cream at the very, very top um, of those hackathons. And this guy was able to stay in that country, which I think is going to be great for that country uh, long term and, and its overall economy. He'll probably start another company uh, after he leaves us and make a hundred million, you know, to have a hundred million dollar a year company without any problem whatsoever because he's a very smart guy. But he would have done that in San Francisco had he moved to San Francisco. And now he's going to do it, you know, in his country of choice. So do you, I mean, there's a company called Mind Valley. Um, they're based in, in Sing, not Singapore, uh, but they're based yeah, in Asia. I, do you know yeah. where they're based? Uh, they have a few different offices yeah. throughout Southeast Asia. So I yeah, think I met one of them. You, you met? Yeah, I, I met one of them. I had a very nice chat with them. They, they seem like um, they're putting together products that, uh, that are really sort of ch trying to change the incumbents that I see within um, the marketing space. And uh, I would say I would include them with uh, companies like Udemy or even some of the longer term academic um, education programs that, uh, that are popping up throughout the United States. Like, uh, I can't remember the names of them right now, but there are a bunch of different organizations that are in essence digitizing university courses. Mm. And that's another big part of remote work in my opinion, because somebody who is, uh, you know, only has a laptop in, um, Indonesia, as an example, can jump online and, and can see every single second of a lecture at MIT or at Harvard or at Yale and can take the courses, can take the quizzes. The data shows right now that the success rate of that is quite low, but it's because they don't have the commitment. They're not in that physical class. But if they're really focused on it, they can absolutely excel at that type of uh, education. And I think that this will, once they're able to really crack the success rate of those types of platforms, it will produce a huge dividend throughout the planet. And I also think that it will, um, it will be, it will probably put a lot of universities out of business, hmm. uh, in, in my opinion, because I, I don't know if, well, I think education is a little bit different in European countries and I'm located in Canada and it's quite cheap here in Canada, but in the United States, people can go hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt. Uh, and I know for us, we don't really look at what education we don't, we don't look at your education as your primary factor. We look at your accomplishments as your primary factor. Uh, one of the top people in the company right now never finished high school. But, and, and this guy is uh, one of the critical employees within our organization of 50 plus people. He is, in, and we hired him because he was able to execute on things in the past. So we knew that he, he could reliably execute on the tasks that we needed him to do. So you guys are 50 plus people, WordPress there. I don't know how many people they are, but they're also working globally. You know, they have employees all over the world mm -hmm. and they, they actually encourage people to go to where they actually really want to live and just work from there. Um, it's the same with Mind Valley. Yep. The same with you guys. The same with me. I'm in London. I have people in Norway, Philippines, uh, Canada. So, I mean, this is this is a very very normal way to work now. Um, what kind of trends? Uh, what kind of growth do you think we'll see in terms of, of working remotely? Well, uh, uh, I think right now probably the remote staffing space. Ace is probably worth about a trillion a year right now. Okay. Um, and I think that you're probably going to see that last year, the, the market grew by approximately 50%, uh, give or take. They'll have different, you know, different organizations will assess it at different levels. But I also think as well, you're almost sort of seeing the effect that um, young people have on this economy. So if you're under the 
age of 35, you're really looking for remote working agreements um, within your organization, right? That's a critical part of, hey, I want to go to Thailand and I want to work out of Thailand for the next three months. Can I do that? No, you have to stay in this office, go to work, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And um, that's not going to really communicate well to these younger people that know, why do I have to work in an office when I'm only communicating with you through a computer? I can do that anywhere. I can do it anywhere on the planet. You know, why would I want to be here? Uh, I think you're going to see the effect of um, Netflix. So right now, Netflix, um, the cable companies have had their first down quarter, uh, I think almost ever in the last 10 years. And the cable companies, you know, you could see their, their profits were going up every single quarter, right? So they're thinking, oh, we're not worried about this. We're not worried about this. But anyone under 30, you know, doesn't have a cable um, subscription. They use Netflix or, or they use Hulu or, you know, whatever your, your application of choice to be able to run these, <clears throat> to be able to get your your entertainment. And so this year they had a down quarter and they're projecting that they could lose 50% of their market share within the next three quarters. It's just collapsing because you'll see it, it will sneak up on you. And I think right now outsourcing is at that point, remote work is at that point where it's, it's sneaking up on us. And all of a sudden the entire system will collapse um, in on itself. And what I mean by system, I mean the, the concept that you have to show up in a physical office to be able to do work. Uh, you've probably seen the same trend that I've seen with regards to co-working spaces. They're popping up everywhere. Yeah. yeah there totally. is, there is an additive effect to this, uh, in the sense that we will soon see this, um, capacity being let up. Like as an example, right now I'm in my office, uh, we have max, you know, five people in um, in our Canadian office. None of them are currently in the office. It's just me <laughs> <laughs> because they. I actually have a, a a guy who he lives three blocks away. He doesn't come into the office. He works from home and he works from co working spaces because he doesn't want to come in, and he has the freedom to do that. And he's going to Bali, you know, for the next three months because he has the freedom to do that. And as long as you get your work done. Right. As long as you get your 140 hours a month completed, uh, I don't care what you do or where you go as long as you execute. And I think that that is the critical component that everyone is kind of missing right now. Uh, the concept of, hey, I have an office that has 100 employees in it is an egotistical one, which will be left behind when people understand that even housing an employee in a physical office automatically adds 25 percent of their costs, you know, into the mix. I mean, so one thing that I, I think about all the time is like, because I, you know, I, yeah, I wrote a book called never work again and all that, but mm -hmm. I actually put in a lot of hours of work, like, and I like it. And, um, I save about an hour a day, maybe one and a half hours, like 90 minutes a day. I would reckon I probably save on travel. Um, that's sure. like Monday to Friday year in and year out. Mm -hmm. If you combine those over the last five, six years, that's a lot of hours. Yep. No, exactly. The, the office that we're at right now, I walk to. It's about a 10-minute walk. Uh, there's but no way I would have, you know, I would drive in an hour or two hours. Or, and also, I would say secondarily to that, I'm quite, uh, I'm actually going to the Philippines next month to be able to spend the summer there working with the team there. But uh, even when I'm there, I'm going to set up a very small loop. So where do I work that's 10 minutes away? Mm. Where do I eat that's 10 minutes away? Uh, I actually have a, this is probably a little weirder than you want to get into, but I have a lot of things systematized within my life. Um, I have my food delivered, my lunch delivered to me every single day. I just negotiated with a, a restaurant around the corner to be able to say, send me this stuff based off of, you know, my dietary needs, send it in and let's negotiate on the price for that. And let's buy all of them preemptively. Uh, I have the same thing that I wear every single day. I have like a work outfit, which is a t-shirt and jeans. And I basically just bought 20 t-shirts and 10 pairs of jeans. And I, that's what I do every single day to just function so that I can remove all of the distractions, um, connected to my main focus, which is basically the mission of the company is allowing people to work wherever they want, whenever they want. Hmm. 
So if we can accomplish that, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a high level goal for us. It's actually a qualitative goal as opposed to a quantitative one. Mm. Um, I know that we're talking about quantitative goals, a million hours a month and a hundred million in payments per year. But um, for us, it's really saying, okay, the, the trillion, you know, the, the, the trillions and trillions of dollars of people that are stuck in offices, I just want to give them the option to be able to work outside of the office if they want. I want them to work at home if they want with their kids. I want them to be able to go at work at co-working spaces. I want them to fly to Bali for three months and, and work there if they want to. Uh, I really want to be able to, I think that that's a better version of the world. And that's what we're really focused on, on building within Time Doctor. So you, you're managing their, you're recording their time, but like, how do you actually project manage? Because you've got like 50 people, how do you actually project manage them? How do, how, how does, how do the things get put into the system? That's a little bit more complicated. So we have project management apps like Basecamp, Asana, and Jira. I know that you use Asana. Mm -hmm. uh, we use Jira for our development tickets. So let's say there's a bug that you would see on Time Doctor. It would go come into our support app on Freshdesk, which we also integrate with. And that Freshdesk ticket would get pushed to Jira. Uh, the JIRA ticket would then get uh, looked at by a developer. That developer would start that task and then track exactly how long it took to accomplish that particular fix for that JIRA ticket. Then it would go to the tester. The tester would test it, you know, for their two hours or something like that, push it to the staging server, and then push it to live. Uh, that's probably a little too granular for you, but that's, the that's our workflow mm -hmm. um, for development as an example. So we have different divisions. Um, within the organization. So I run the marketing team and uh, we have procedures in place for everything that we do within the organization. We have probably, we have a huge wiki doc with, um, oh boy, I'd say probably over a thousand procedures at this point. And a wiki doc is different from uh, simple Google docs in that the documents are editable and can change over time and evolve. So if we think that changes need to be made, we encourage the employees to be able to we make those changes. We actually have a, um, a commission, a bonus system for anyone that can make changes that are accepted by the rest of the community. So we just redid all of our SEO procedures a while ago, and we had our SEO team go in and actually make those changes um, organically to those wiki documents so that we knew exactly, so, so that they could basically say, yeah, we're going to make these changes uh, and you're going to get rewarded if you update the documentation to um, to this to the cutting edge type of uh, information. We have a saying in the company that orders shouldn't be easy to understand; they should be impossible to misunderstand. And uh, that's actually Napoleon who gave that quote. Mm -hmm. And it's a great quote. And it's a, it's really it, it's such a slight difference in the way that we do process documentation. Um, like we had a client that. I was chatting with, <clears throat> and uh, he, told the, he told his employee, hey, go on to WordPress, uh, or go on to my, my server, install WordPress, figure out, uh, you know, here's the password and login that you need to be able to set up for this WordPress server, and, you know, let's, let's start in installing a theme. So he comes back the next day, and he said, like, uh, what's WordPress? I don't know what that is. And number one, he shouldn't have hired that person, uh, but I said secondarily, where is your process connected to this? Do you do this more than once? And this guy was setting up like dozens of WordPress uh, builds a week. And he said, yeah, I do it all the time. And he said, I said, every single step within that process should be documented. Mm. Step one, log into this page. Step two, here, you know, here's the next page. And then include a video. So we have video tutorials with every single process as well so that we can take that documentation and say, okay, um, you guys go out and, and do what you need to do um, uh, and, and basically, you know, without me telling you what to do, you can know what to do. So there's at no point someone is lost saying, oh, what do I do right now? You say, okay, look at procedure 23.A and that's exactly what you do and here's a 20-minute video tutorial showing you exactly how to do it. Um, so that's, that's big for us is getting those. And, and I would suggest that anyone that's doing remote work, make sure, and it, it's a huge task, but just do it very slowly. Start with your most important tasks so that you can take, let's say 30 minutes of training off your desk, 
you know, every single week. You can tell people to, you know, you can train employees 30 minutes less, 30 minutes less every week. <clears throat> That's great. Uh, you know, operationalize a process to be able to do that and then do the next process and the next process. And then your time is freed up to be able to do, um, much more higher leverage tasks, like as an example, speak on podcasts, as opposed to make sure that the servers are running. So you are coming out with a new launch of the the app um, soon. Um, if it's not live already, when when we launch this version of the of the uh, podcast, um, what is new and and how much does this cost? It's ten dollars per user per month. Um, so if you're tracking a remote employee, it's as I said, 10 bucks per user per month, which is quite affordable in comparison to any other type of um, platform that you would look at. Usually these platforms work on a percentage of salary. <clears throat> so they'll usually take between 10 to 15% of an employee's salary. And we just charge you a flat rate of uh, $10 million per user, or sorry, not $10 million. <laughs> $10 billion. At, $10 billion, yeah. I'm looking <laughs> at, our, at our doc right now. Uh, $10 per user per month. So that is something that is quite easy. We integrate actually with a lot of different uh, payment processors. A lot of people don't understand that moving money internationally is quite difficult. Um, you know, moving money into Russia, as an example, is almost impossible at this point. And uh, we integrate with payment processors that can actually get that money into that particular country. And we can do it for as little as 1% because we have special agreements set up with these companies. Um, and we, we, in essence, uh, we sign off on the users that are, we basically co-sign on these, <clears throat> these payroll agreements with some of our customers to be able to get that cost down to 1%. So moving money globally for 1% is really sort of the, um, the holy grail. And we've been able to execute on that. We integrate with guys like PayPal and TransferWise and CoCard and Payoneer. And we have proprietary deals with all of them. Um, we also have the client's view as well, which is a brand new feature that we just pushed. And that will allow you to, in essence, provide um, information to your clients on exactly what your employees are doing. So let's say you have a client that you that's completing a particular project for you, uh, or sorry, for a client, like let's say putting together a design spec, you can create a project within Time Doctor, and then that client can only see that project's data. So let's say it's worked on by five or six employees, you'd only see the time spent on that particular project for those five or six employees. And that's actually completely free um, with every copy of Time Doctor. So that's been huge right now, and we've been doing quite well at uh, putting that together. And then we also just built a pretty fantastic API. So if you want to build a higher level integration with Time Doctor and integrate it directly within your platform or within your website, uh, if you're a BPO company, as an example, we can basically create a system that uh, will, in essence, look like a, an Odesk or an Elance or a freelancer if you want it to. Um, and that is absolutely free as well with uh, every seat of Time Doctor that, um, that you're using. So that's about it. You know, we're, we're just really excited about these million hours per month. Um, our projection is we want to do 10 million hours per month within the next five years. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to hit that number. And uh, uh, anybody that, you know, wants to get more information from me, you can just email us or just go to timedoctor.com to be able to get a trial. Liam, it has been a true pleasure meeting another outsourcing guru that provides super cool software to help us dominate the world. <laughs> Thanks, Erlen. I appreciate that. It's very cool to hang out with another uh, outsourcing guru that can actually speak the same speak as I'm, you know, as me. It's, it's a very rare pleasure. So I appreciate you taking the time. This podcast is brought to you by MrOutsource.com. Outsourcing to the Philippines done for you. Mr. Outsource is a recruitment company matching busy entrepreneurs with Filipino virtual assistants. So you can have the time to focus on what's important.